non-essential businesses will stay closed. Only essential services should remain open. Unfortunately, many people are still not taking it seriously. There were crowds of people visiting the cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C. and Jessica Andres! Whoa! Large gatherings on the beach in Ocean City and on the boardwalk and at many of the county and local parks across our state. Let me repeat once again as strongly as I possibly can. If you are engaged in this kind of activity, you are breaking the law, and you are literally endangering the lives of your family, your friends, and your fellow citizens. Go down, you murderer, go down. Um, as I told the people of Ohio yesterday, the monster is still loose. I'm scared. It doesn't seem like folks here are scared enough. All right, here is the official reentry from the basement, cleared by CDC, a little sweaty, just worked out, happens. This is what I've been dreaming of, literally for weeks. My wife, yeah, right. <laughs> she was cleared by the CDC. She doesn't have fever, she doesn't have the symptoms anymore, more than seven days from her quarantine. We're still a little scared, so I'll just give you one of these. Get away from her, you bitch! Humans are the virus. Walmart. Screw small businesses. That's right. So you just compared it to the annual influenza. Um, so there is a vaccine typically for that. Um, the new IHME numbers, University of Washington model that I think most of our leaders have been referring to, um, suggests about 60,000 deaths nationwide by August 4th. That would be fewer than what the annual influenza caused a couple of years ago with a vaccine. So does that shake your faith at all in the utility of a vaccine for this disease? Maybe it's not the final answer. destroy America, shred the Constitution, trample the Bill of Rights, obey your governor. The governors are in charge now. We will be your daddy. Do not disobey your daddy. Yeah, it doesn't shake my faith in, in either the vaccine, uh, which uh, I'm, uh, all experts think is at least a year, a year and a half away. It does tell me that if the death tolls are around the numbers that you've just referred to, Tucker, that all of the actions we're taking are making a difference. Do not disobey your daddy. Let me ask you about the specific measures you just referred to. Uh, now, large gatherings are banned. Um, but liquor stores are deemed an essential service. Why, uh, on the basis of what scientific evidence did you decide that? A couple of things. One is there are liquor stores in our state that actually have a little bit too many backroom gatherings. The governors are in charge now. So we had a little bit of a challenge. We had to remind folks that liquor stores may be opening, but uh, uh, may be open. But to your point, gatherings are not allowed. We will be your daddy. If we were to shut shutter those stores down, we'd have unintended mental health and addiction uh, prices to pay, unintended consequences. So, but you have closed church services and synagogue services and arrested people for attempting to attend them. Do not disobey your daddy. Did anyone say that? maybe practicing your faith might be important to someone's mental health? Critical thinking in this way as an aberration must be destroyed. Listen, I think we've had a very good, uh, uh, good common ground with faith leaders of literally every faith who understand this. Uh, and by the way, whether it's a liquor store, uh, a pharmacy, a uh, supermarket, we expect folks to distance themselves from each other, to wear face coverings, etc. We will be your daddy. 
There's an enormous amount of right. faith going on virtually right now, a, a lot of practicing going on, and we care deeply about both physical health and mental health. Of course, but I, I just, and I, and, I, and I don't want to be too persistent on this, but I, I think it's important. On what scientific basis did you decide that sitting in a church was much more dangerous than buying liquor in a liquor store? And why is yeah, buying liquor more important for the social fat? I mean, I'm just I'm just trying to think. You're not the only governor who's done this, and I don't mean to pick on you, but it, I, no. I don't understand the reasoning. I don't want to think it had anything to do with tax revenues. I've spoken to Cardinal Tobin, to the leaders of the Jewish community, of the Muslim community. People are at peace where we have come out. So why, um, back a couple of weeks ago, you closed state parks and people have been arrested for using them. A man was arrested for sitting alone on the beach. Tell me why um, that poses a danger. And again, on what scientific basis did you make that decision? Yeah, so, so Tucker, we were coming into both warm weather and big religious uh, seasons. It was Passover first, then Easter. We've got Ramadan coming up shortly. Uh, and certain of the counties were beginning to close their parks. Uh, and the concern was uh, that the folks who couldn't go to their normal park would go to another park, a, another county or a state park. And it wasn't just a, a gut feel. We then surveilled uh, the state up and down the state on that first weekend of April when we had some good weather in New Jersey. Do not disobey your daddy. And in fact, that was just what we saw. Lots of people congregating, lots of out of state license plates. Arrest them. So it was a step, trust me, I took no joy in taking that step. Uh, but it's one that we felt we had but, to but, take. But, and as I mentioned to a bunch of legislators on, on, today, on it's not a life sentence. Okay, but on what basis? What scientific? Because we're, we're. I'm just trying to get to the science here because I, I, I assume all of us are following the lead of epidemiologists. Arresting someone for sitting alone on the beach. Tell me how that arrests the spread of the coronavirus from an epidemiological point of view. Yeah, I wasn't referring to that. I actually don't have the specifics as to why that happened. I meant congregation at state and county parks, of which there was an enormous amount when that the weather got warm and okay. the fact that folks weren't it's not that they couldn't be in the park and jogging by themselves or walking on their own and keeping distance they weren't danger you are not maintaining a six foot distance abort now destroy all humans and there were a lot of out of state license plates in the parking lots and and we've got some of the nicest parks in the northeast if not the country Again, it brings me no joy, but we felt that was the right decision to make. Huh. So um, you made that decision, and as I noted before, 15 congregants at a synagogue in New Jersey were arrested and charged for being in a synagogue together. Now, the Bill of Rights, as you well know, protects Americans' right, enshrines their right to practice their religion as they see fit and to congregate together to assemble peacefully. By what authority did you nullify the Bill of Rights in issuing this order? How do you have the power yeah, to we do were, that? That's above my pay grade, Tucker. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't thinking of the Bill of Rights when we did this. Try not to overthink things, okay? Since you are, since you are a, an elected official, a leader in the government, an executive, how do you have the authority to order something that so clearly contravenes the Bill of Rights of the United States, the U.S. Constitution. Where do you get the authority to do that? Well, here's, here's the thing. We know we need to stay away from each other. 911, what is your emergency? Yeah, I'd like to report a, a crime in progress. Uh, there's a group of about 12 kids playing soccer, and we were hoping you guys could come out and arrest them all. On the nearly deserted streets of Liverpool this afternoon, officers were out talking rather than enforcing the rules on leaving the house. We're just out really making sure that people understand the need to stay oh, indoors, but you clearly do, oh, don't you? But there's been criticism that police are acting differently in different places, with one force issuing more than a hundred fines. The chief constable here has taken a friendlier approach. It's very much about encouraging our public to do the right things, engaging with them, uh, education as has been said and enforcement is very much the final option for us we don't want to go out and alienate thousands of people because we're being heavy-handed in relation to this 
But some forces have been criticised. Derbyshire Police has defended this video it published last week, which used a drone to show people visiting the Peak District. A former Supreme Court judge called it disgraceful and says police have to separate government advice from enforceable laws. They do not prevent people, for example, from driving to beauty spots to take their exercise there. They don't prevent people from buying things that the police might consider to be non-essential foods. Uh, they don't prevent all sorts of things that the police in some parts of the country have been trying to prevent. But there is specific behaviour the police can enforce. They might send or take people back to where they live if they're out for anything other than daily exercise or picking up essential items. They can instruct groups of three or more to go home and can fine people who are outside without a valid reason. Back in the 1970s, I was this enthusiastic psychology major in college and I was trying to figure out what I believed and why I believed the things that I did. And so I would read various kinds of things. And I came across a book by Carl Menninger and he's kind of a pioneer in psychiatry and psychology. And in his book, Dr. Menninger used the term groupthink. And, and as soon as I saw that word, it's like a little light bulb went off with me. It's like, oh, I can so relate. People have been locked up. We've been talking about cabin fever. Uh, now it's a nice day. I'm going to get out. I'm going to go take a walk. Now is not the time to do that. And frankly, there has been a laxness uh, on social distancing, especially over this past weekend, that is just wholly unacceptable. You know, when we talk about groupthink, we talk about having pressure to conform to a group's biases. And it's done in such a way that inhibits creative and independent and out of the box kind of thinking. And especially groupthink will discourage dissent. We must flatten the curve. We expect folks to distance themselves from each other. You are breaking the law. Parks locked up. But in Toronto, they've been the scene of social distancing fails, leading to dozens of complaints. We just heard a little bit more music, and because my boyfriend and I are in the middle of a move, we happen to be outside. In Revelstoke, B.C., Zoe Purvis was shocked to see a party across the street and called the RCMP non-emergency line to report it. Played a little bit on my heartstring just because I'm being so cautious. They either don't know or they just really don't care. Or they don't groupthink. See this as totalitarian. Don't snitch on their neighbors and know that just driving in their car, they are more likely to be killed and kill someone in an accident. In short, they might also be thoughtful people who, because of the fear that's been incited, you have lost perspective of and have literally reported your neighbor for having friends over. You should actually hear yourself. Revisit this video if you think like this woman a year from now if we have it. They're constantly monitored by facial recognition cameras that are able to instantly put a face to a name. Now the Chinese are also ranked, given a mark out of a possible 950 points. A score in the 700s is considered good, around the 500 mark is not. For now, the number is a sort of bank credit rating, keeping track of everyone's spending habits. I think being ranked is a good thing. A society has to have rules. It forces us to be well behaved. It may seem scary, but it's just like that here. We're used to it. And anyway, we don't have a choice. Groupthink sets up the potential for abuse, where a person can be scorned simply for being not the same, simply for being different. In an effort to keep all of its subjects in line, Beijing is taking the system a step further in 2020. It's aggregating data gathered by banks, private companies and the state to rate if someone's a good or bad citizen. By using the most data possible, the so-called big data, the system will play an important role in rebuilding a moral society. The state will go over every detail of a person's life with a fine-tooth comb their financial situation, spending habits, career, even behaviour on social media. Criticising the government online or displaying outward signs of wealth is a no-no. On the other hand, praising the party or giving blood increases your social credit. Xiao Wen Wang is a model citizen. She lives in Nanjing, 
a testing ground for social ranking. Married with a child, she has a job in a retirement home, no debts, and she wouldn't dream of jaywalking. As a good citizen, I respect the rules of the road. If I didn't, I'd lose points on my social credit. In theory, everything can be taken into account in the social score, even the most innocuous errands like supermarket shopping. When Xiao Wen Wang makes an electronic payment, her purchases tell the state a lot about her. Buying cigarettes would count against her. On the other hand, nappies show she's an attentive mother. Beer could indicate alcoholism. She'd be better off buying water. In this pilot city of 8 million people, there are only 18,000 model citizens. For Xiao Wen Wang, there are perks to be had, such as paying half price for the bus. I get discounts for all public services, even at museums. And the library is free for me, thanks to my school. A good school brings benefits, but people with low scores lose rights. The cinema names and shames people considered untrustworthy, plastering their details, even their addresses, across big screens. It's a matter of principle. Those people have to be condemned. Unfortunately, many people are still not taking it seriously. Those people aren't honest, so they have to pay the price. It's only right to pay your debts. You have to blacklist those that don't. The Supreme Court has created a blacklist for so-called bad citizens, those whose ratings have dropped to zero. On it are companies, but also 23 million people to date. Among them is this journalist Liu Hu. He got a little too close to uncovering corruption among high-profile party members. After being sued for defamation by the subject of a story he'd written, he was blacklisted. But he only realized when he tried to buy a train ticket and was told he was banned from traveling. That tells me I'm still on the blacklist. Punished because he's been branded untrustworthy by the state. Mm. Once you're blacklisted, you can no longer get a bank loan, start a business, buy an apartment, or even send your children to a private school. Yu Hu is among a tiny minority of people who have dared to criticize the system, which some are calling a digital dictatorship. I worry, because I think many people like me will be deprived of individual freedoms, and all of us will live with restrictions of one kind or another. After our meeting, Yu Hu learned that his name had been removed from the blacklist, but he still has a long way to go if he doesn't want to languish at the bottom of the social credit hierarchy. For those of you just unquestioningly in compliance with this unprecedented takeover of our rights and liberties, what world do you think you live in? Do you actually trust your media, your entertainment industry? Can you? Do you think it's not all essentially a propaganda wing of the government? Are you that blind? You're so willing to report your neighbor for having some guests over or yell at kids in the backyard who are playing together in your artificially induced fear state driven by the media and you're essentially inviting what's to come on in. This may be it, or it may just be a test run, but they're learning quite a lot about your social score. God bless you in Jesus' name.